Okay, if you'd take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. The book of Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to start a series uh, for our Sunday afternoon recordings. Over the next several weeks, I think it's going to probably go uh, about eight weeks, on the five warnings of Hebrews. There's five warnings, um, sections of the book of Hebrews that are warnings. And uh, so we're going to take the time and look at these five warnings in the book of Hebrews. This one comes out of, the first one comes out of Hebrews chapter 2 and starting at verse number 1. And the title is, The More Earnest Heed. The More Earnest Heed. Before I get into the message, I wanted to make sure that all that are listening online understand that uh, coming up uh, this Sunday, we're going to have a workers meeting and encouraging all of our workers to be here, talk about the future and plans and things. And then on the 23rd, um, Sunday the 23rd, the McCloskeys will be with us. They've been with us several times before, and uh, we love to hear their singing. They do a tremendous job, and uh, Brother Pat McCluskey will be preaching for us. That's our friend and family Sunday. We have a gift for everyone that comes, and for visitors, we have a special gift. We have a gift every Sunday for visitors that come. But we have an extra special gift that we're going to give you for coming on that Sunday. So we want to work hard and invite others to come and have a great day on Sunday, August the 23rd. Uh, as school gets started again in whatever way your school is getting started in your area and um, uh, getting ready for the fall and, and all that's happening there uh, we, we at our church every year have our uh, missions month in the month of October. We're still planning on everything uh, with that, special speakers throughout the month, and then also our Bearing Precious Seed, um, binding uh, the John and Romans, getting those out to other countries. Um, we are going to, uh, you know, social distance for that, and uh, uh, we have some plans in place but we, we don't want the pandemic to stop us from being active in getting the word of God out. And so um, uh, help us with that. Um, as we have been through the summer months, we've been doing mail outs, special mail outs. Um, and we had a visitor at our last service from the mail outs and uh, talked uh, favorably about coming back again. So that's great. And uh, we continue on and uh, we've seen um, some people baptized here lately someone gets saved here lately it's encouraging uh, even though we're in difficult times Hebrews chapter 2 starting at verse number 1 through verse number 4 the more earnest heed the first warning in the book of Hebrews in Hebrews 2 and starting at verse 1 the Bible says therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip for if the word of God, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Verse 4 God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. And we see that ends with a question mark. Now we're going to look at this, uh, these verses, study, but let me say first of all, the book of Hebrews, very interesting book. Um, it, is, um, it is a book uh, good to read, it is deep, and a lot of good study here. Um, we are not sure of the physical author of the book. When I say that, of course, God wrote the entire Bible. But he used men to pen the words, and we're not sure of what man he chose and used. Uh, most people think it's the Apostle Paul. I kind of lean that way, that it was probably the Apostle Paul that wrote it. Some say that it could have been Luke um, because of a statement in the first chapter is much like the book of Luke. Um, possibly uh, Luke, some say that even Barnabas uh, could have been the author. It doesn't matter who God used, it matters that it is God's word. And uh, God uses many people. 
uh, in various ways. It was written to Hebrew Christians, those that were Jews that were saved, and it's an encouragement to them and, a, and lessons to them. But also we see these warnings that are given, the five warnings. These address the issue of the temptation of the Hebrew Christians to return to Judaism. Now it was in that day um, a big problem in many of the churches that uh, there were what, what has been called Judaizers. They were Christians, but they wanted to go back to Old Testament things. And I call them Christians. I use that term loosely. They called themselves Christians. They said they accepted Christ, but they said that uh, you have to also practice the Old Testament uh, laws and ceremonies and things like that in order to be saved. Of course, Hebrews um, uh, deals with this issue. Um, this way, if they, if they practice this, they would avoid persecution and they would enjoy the legal protection from the government if they would practice these things. Um, you know, listen, <clears throat> we, as, we as fundamental independent Baptists, we don't compromise the issue. Uh, there is a great temptation to compromise. And this, these warnings deal with compromise. Uh, he says here, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That's the phrase that stands out in these verses. Uh, the word of God and um, salvation. What if we neglect it? What if we don't uh, adhere to what the Bible says about salvation? How are we going to escape? I'm going to deal with that. Um, in the message today. So it deals with the subject of compromise. There's so much compromise today. So much compromise. And uh, to compromise on, on the word of God and the teaching of the word of God and uh, the standards that the Bible has set for us to live by, there's so much compromise on those standards today. So many churches are, are so worldly. They're just letting the world in and control their church uh, we don't want to do that. We want God to uh, control our church and show us what to do and follow him no matter what circumstances come. And so let's look first of all at verse number one again. Hebrews chapter two, verse one. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Of course, the title of the message is the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them Slip. First of all, my first point is this, the exhortation that we find in this verse of Scripture. The first word of chapter 2 of this warning is, therefore. Now, if you've heard me preach very many times, you understand that I, when I see the word therefore, I always like to stop and see what therefore is there for. Because in the Scripture, we know that the word therefore is there for a reason. And so it points back to the previous chapter, chapter 1, where everything's getting established for this book of the Bible, the book of Hebrews. Uh, the writer, having proved Christ to be superior to the angels, he's talking about that in chapter 1, that Christ is superior to the angels. You know, when you preach the word of God, when you know the gospel, you lift up Christ. You can never go wrong by uplifting Christ. And so we see that this is proven. It was demonstrated that the gospel is more excellent than the law. Um, I'm so glad we live in the age of grace and not in the age of the law. And we're under grace. And grace is, of course, wonderful. And it's so much more excellent than the law. There was a time, of course, if we look in the Old Testament, where um, uh, God uh, gave the law, people lived by the law, and that was fine. It pointed forward to Christ. But we live under the time of grace. And then he says this, he uses these words that are used as the title, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Pay attention, that's what he's saying. Pay attention to those things that we have heard from God, from the word of God, and the preaching of the word of God. Take heed, he says, and give the more earnest heed to the things which we 
have heard. Realize the importance of the truth of God's word. God's word is important. What is more important than the word of God? And do not let them slip. That's what he says at the end of the verse. Lest at any time we should let them slip. This word, let them slip, this meaning of slip, is kind of the depiction. I guess a good illustration would be um, just recently <clears throat> I was on a lake on a boat. And when you pull the boat up to the dock, what you must do is get the rope and tie the boat up to the dock. Uh, for some years, I pastored in Florida, and while we were there for a short time, we owned a boat until I found out how much a boat costs, and so it's a lot uh, uh, simple, easier, and more um, uh, better in my budget if I just rent one when I want one, but anyhow, well, during that time, um, we parked at a place. Of course, in Florida, the tides go up and down, so when you tie your boat up to the dock, you need to leave some rope so that the tide going up and down uh, will not uh, damage your boat. But as you pull the boat up to the dock, if you don't take that rope and tie the boat to the dock, the boat will drift or slip away. Slowly it will slip or drift away. It's not going to stay right to the dock unless it's tied there. It's going to slip away. This is a good illustration. Lest at any time we should let them slip. You know, it, it, it's true in our lives and in churches. How does someone, a Christian, who's been saved, baptized, and in the church, all of a sudden end up off on some tangent or something wrong because they let it slip? They slowly drifted away. I can see the danger during this pandemic of the time of letting things slip. If you're not faithful to church, if you're not listening to the word of God, if you're not staying in the word of God, if you let those things slip, you'll start to drift away. It's human nature. It's true for all of us. We've got to stay in the word of God and stay with the word of God so that we don't let these things slip away. You can so easily slip away from the truth and the things of the truth. If you're listening to uh, the, uh, uh, you know, what's given on television and radio and the news and things. And, and who do you believe and what do you believe? I'll tell you what you believe. You believe what the Bible says. Believe the word of God and live by faith and trust in him. Why? Because you can so easily slip away from the truth. Do not change your doctrine, uh, what you believe and your principles that you stand on, your doctrine, because of laziness. It's so easy today to get lazy. It seems like that our government almost promotes laziness. People getting their unemployment for not working and then getting an extra bonus on top of that for not working. It's easy to get lazy. It's our nature. It's our human nature to be lazy. You can't be lazy. You can't be lazy in the things of Christ. Uh, peer pressure that, that pushes you and causes you to slip away if you're not careful. So the exhortation is that give the earnest heed and pay attention lest you let, let things slip away. Secondly, in verse number two, we see stimulation. Excuse me, simulation. Sorry, simulation. Exhortation and then simulation. Verse number two. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Now I'm going to stop there. The verse stops there. It doesn't end with a period. It is not the end of the sentence, but it gives us this simulation. Um, it was steadfast. The word spoken by angels was steadfast. Now, as I said, remember in the chapter before, he's proving that Christ is better uh, than the angels, superior to the angels. And he's saying, uh, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and they, they believe that, turn with me to the book of Galatians chapter 3. Then we'll come back here to the book of Hebrews, but just for a second, turn to Galatians chapter 3, and let's look here at verse number 19. Galatians 3, 19. Wherefore, then serveth the law. Question. Wherefore, then serveth the law. 
It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Let me stop there and explain this. It was added. The law was added because of transgression. There was a time, uh, you know, when uh, Adam and Eve uh, left the garden until Moses gave the law. Uh, there was a time there they didn't live under the law. Adam and Eve in the garden lived in the age of, we call it the age of innocence. And uh, then before the law, what was he saying? The law was given because of the transgression. Why do we have the law? Because people do their own thing and because people do things that are wrong. What if our town had no speed limit signs? Think about that. We have to have it. Why? Because we live in a sin-cursed world and people are sinners. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. He's talking about the word that was given by angels. You know what angels are? Angels are simply messengers of God. Messengers of God. So therefore, whatever the angels brought and they talk about here and the promise that was given, as it says in Galatians 3, and the word spoken by angels in verse 2 here of Hebrews 2 is steadfast. What was that? It was from God. It was a message from God because they are messengers. The message was sure. The message was firm. And the message was stable. You could believe the message. It was a just message. Look at this, what the verse says. And every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. It was just. There was nothing wrong with the law given in the New Testament. Nothing wrong. As the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, I'm not throwing out the law. I'm not saying the law, the, the law was wrong, but it was given for a specific time and a purpose. And we don't go back to that now. God is always a just God, whether in the age of innocence, in the age of conscience before the law, in the age of the law, in the age of grace, or in the future, God is always a just God. You can believe and trust in him, whether the Old Testament or the New Testament. Number three, my third point is verses three and four, and that is this, the obligation. The obligation. Look at verse three, first of all. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? What a statement. What a statement. We can think of that in several different ways. It, it, how are we going to escape if we neglect so great salvation? We are obligated to recognize and receive so great salvation. We as human beings, we are obligated to recognize and to receive this great salvation. The Bible says it was, it was given and presented to all mankind. All mankind have an opportunity to be saved. The Bible tells us that, Romans chapter 1. Nobody has an excuse not to trust Christ and be born again. So we are obligated to recognize and receive this great salvation. If you neglect it, if you count it as nothing, if you neglect it, you will not escape the just recompense of your sin. If you, listen, if you... Um, are listening and you have never been born again, you've never received that salvation, how are you going to escape the just recompense of God and the justice of God? You're not going to escape. There is no escape. But listen, also the fact that every Christian ought to understand if you neglect your salvation, you've already been saved, but if you neglect that salvation, how are you going to escape the chastisement of God upon your life? If you forget about what he did for you and the salvation that you have received. Another aspect I want to look at this, uh, this phrase here. How shall we escape if we ne neglect so great salvation? What makes it great? It was proclaimed by Jesus Christ. Our salvation was proclaimed and given and brought on by Jesus Christ. It was confirmed by eyewitnesses that were there at the time, saw Jesus die on the cross, saw him buried in the tomb, and saw him resurrected, and talked to him, and spent time with him, 
the gospel, our salvation is great because also it was authenticated by God himself. It is a great salvation that we have. Knowing Jesus Christ, what great salvation. The Christian will not escape the chastisement of God. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Verse 4, God also hearing them a witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. How, you, how are you going to escape that if you neglect it? You know, and, and like I said already, the church, or the, the, um, the, the uh, Christian is not going to escape the chastisement of God if you neglect so great salvation. Why did he save you? He saved you to be one of his children in his family. If you're saved, you're born again, you're in the family of God. You cannot get out of the family of God. You are born into that family. The new birth in Jesus Christ. But what if you neglect? You know, some people neglect their family. They may, have, they may have a good family, a family that loves them. But they go off on their own and they do their own thing and they don't communicate with their family and they don't um, uh, <clears throat> acknowledge their family. And, and uh, you know, and, and what, what good does the family do for them and how can they help if they neglect their own family? Well, listen, Christian. How are you going to escape the chastisement of God if you neglect the salvation that has brought you into the family of God? Hey, listen, uh, don't neglect church attendance. During this time of pandemic, uh, there have been Christians that have gotten lazy about going to church. You ought to be in the house of God. Now, I know some people are high risk and they need to stay at home, but that just says this. You ought to be watching these videos that we are putting out uh, for Sunday morning and for Sunday uh, afternoon service. You ought to be faithful at watching them. That ought to be part of your week if you cannot come to the service. Uh, but I know most of us can be here in the house of God. But I have seen people, I have seen people get lazy in church attendance. Be in the house of God. Uh, be faithful in your giving. Don't give up. Hey, we still have bills to pay. We still have missionaries to keep on the field. We still are trying to do things at the church here. Uh, we have uh, got our sound booth in and we got some new equipment and we're putting that in, uh, uh, you know, so that we can have even better sound here in the church. Some of our equipment's getting old and we need to replace it. Uh, you know, there's still bills to pay and things. Be faithful in your giving. Be faithful in reading the Bible. Get into the Word of God. Read the Bible. Be faithful at it. Be faithful in prayer. We have a prayer meeting time on Wednesday night. We meet together, we take requests, we have prayer together, and we have a Bible study. Be faithful in prayer. Be faithful in your own personal prayer. Be faithful in witnessing. You say, preacher, it's awful hard to witness during this time, but I understand that, but we still ought to. You can share the messages with others. You can, like at the church here, we're sending out mailings that give the gospel uh, to people. Be faithful. We see a picture here of the father disciplining his children. Listen, God's people ought to be following the Lord, doing what he says. If you're not one of his children, would you come to Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior and be born again? Know that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Listen, these warnings in the book of Hebrews, we're going to look throughout the book of Hebrews. I hope you'll stay with us and that God will speak to your heart through his word. May God bless you.